Amen. So I'm excited uh, to be here. Before I get started here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, just keep your place there. Let me just say uh, thanks uh, to Pastor Mejia and the church staff for having me, um, even though I kind of invited myself. <laughs> we're uh, we're uh, running some errands here, and we figured we'd make a churchcation out of it. So yeah, that's uh, one of the nice things about having um, a lot of you have done it too. And a lot of nice thing about having a lot of churches up and down the West Coast is uh, when you're coming uh, to town or you're going up and down, you can go and visit uh, friends and, and brothers and sisters in Christ. So keep your place there in verse, uh, we're going to look down at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 in just a few minutes, but let me just say, uh, let me just give you a little bit of background. I was trying not to give away the whole uh, sermon talking to the guys um, out in the front, but um, I am not from a city. I am from uh, Nowhereville, North Dakota. Um, L.A. is absolutely, and I know this isn't L.A., you don't have to explain that to me, but the whole area of L.A. is fascinating to me. I mean, it is, it is, I've been here two or three times, but every time I drive through here, it is, it's mind-blowing um, to me. I don't know um, how else uh, to say it. Um, it's, it would be hard for me, it would be hard for me to describe the kind of middle of nowhere that I grew up in um, to you. But I kind of want to explain, like, I did meet a guy. I grew up on a, uh, we came from a farm in North Dakota that, you know, it wasn't, you couldn't GPS your way to uh, the farm. And uh, kind of a, a opposite of what I want to kind of explain to you is I had a, a delivery driver delivering some fencing materials to me um, a couple of years ago, a couple of years before we moved, and he was from New Jersey. And this guy was from the big city and he couldn't find the place, so I had to actually jump in my pickup and go and get him and bring him back um, to the farm. And by the time he got out of the truck, he was literally, he was freaking out. He just, he was like, I, I, I didn't know places like this existed. <laughs> I mean, there's no trees, there's just nothing, there's nobody, and he, he thought he was gonna die out there unless this guy <laughs> in a white pickup came out and found him. And the way I found him was like, well, tell me, uh, what does the field to your right look like? You know, and that kind of thing. Is there, you know, is there a substation? Did you pass a substation? You know, that kind of thing. But the flip side of that is like, when I come to a place like LA, it is, it is always going to be, I've lived in Dallas, Texas, and now I live um, in Fresno. So it's not like, you know, I'm afraid of a city, but a place like this is always going to be shocking to me. Today we went to, um, we went downtown to the, not downtown, but we went to the harbor and we toured the USS um, Iowa. And my, my grandfather was in, was in uh, the South Pacific in World War II, so I'm kind of fascinated with that kind of thing. I always try to, I, I was really close to my grandfather, so when I look at ships like that, I'm always thinking of some farm kid pulled off the farm and dropped on a ship like that, and what would that be like? So, you know, we're sitting there in the harbor and we're literally, we're sitting on the deck of the battleship having a hot dog. I mean, you know, you, there's a hot dog stand on the battleship, too. I mean, and I'm, we're having a hot dog, and we're watching all the cargo ships come in. And I just, I looked at my wife, and I said, if it gets any better than this, I don't know. <laughs> you know? And she's like, can we go to my stuff next? But anyway. <laughs> the point is, I, I, I just, it, it's fascinating. The bridges, the people. I mean, they say everyone's leaving California, but there's got to be a few more people that leave here before. I mean, it's like eight lanes of traffic in every direction. It doesn't matter what time it is. There's people bumper to bumper on the roads. It is a culture shock for me. That's what I'm trying to say. So tonight, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to bring these cultures together. All right? I'm going to try to bring the culture that I grew up in to your culture and bring your culture to my culture. All right? All that introduction, look down at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is kind of like one of the themes of the, the chapter is things that are edifying to you and things that are not edifying to you. Really what it's, it's focusing on is words that are edifying to you. But look down at verse number 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, if you would, for a minute, it, where the Bible says, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? He's saying, you know, if I come and I speak words to you and they don't mean anything, what good is that for you? You know, in the context of it is, you know, speaking in different languages and all those things. But generally, what he's saying is words matter. He's saying words matter. But look down at verse number 7. 
He even goes further here where he says, even things without life, giving sound. What's he talking about? He's talking about this stuff right here. He's talking about things, instruments. All right? He says, things without life, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction of the sounds, how shall it be known, what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? I'm reminded of Numbers chapter 10, where the trumpet had to sound a certain way, and then the people would know, you know, is it war? Are we going to church? What are we doing here? Right? By the way the sound, um, you know, by the way the instrument acted, by the way the instrument sounded. So what I'm trying to get you to see here is that words and sounds matter in your life. The title of the sermon tonight, and the way I'm going to bring these two cultures together, the title of the sermon is Hip Hop Honky Tonk. <laughs> you say, what are you talking about? So I did some research. I did some research on L.A. and all you people from L.A. And it turns out that it's kind of like the birthplace of hip hop and rap and all this kind of stuff. And if I'm stereotyping you and you're offended, you're going to be offended for about another 50 minutes. So just, it's, it, it's okay. But I always thought, you know, I mean, I, I did some research. We got people here like, you know, Sugar Puff, uh, Dr. Knight, and Dre Daddy, kind of people that are, you know, um, from the LA area or into this hip hop stuff. And like, I'm getting more and more in, you know, kind of educated, you know, forcefully on accident against my will, you know, living in California in the hip hop and rap cultures that you'll hear it, you know, played in people's cars and things like this. Now, you say, how are you going to bring these cultures together? Well, I grew up, I grew up with, you know, my main thing that I grew up with, you know, on the farm and just being out in the country was country music. Go, go figure, right? <laughs> I grew up with names like, you know, George Strait and Alan Jackson and, you know, all these, you know, Kenny Chesney. He was kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of dating myself here. He was kind of younger when I was, I was growing up. But the point is this. You say these cultures are completely different, right? These cultures are completely different. I'm going to show you tonight how the cultures of country music, this, this, you think that this is so different than hip-hop and rap and all these different things. I want to show you how these cultures are exactly the same, actually. I want to give you three themes of the culture that I grew up in and how it matches perfectly the more I learn about the culture of the, you know, this urban culture. I'm sure it's not just L.A. I'm sure it's urban culture. And look, the, the hip-hop stuff and the rap stuff, it's out in, it's out in the Midwest, too. It's, it's creeping all over there as well. But you think about, you know, I, I did a sermon series, and I kind of was back in this sermon series um, in the last couple of weeks. I did a sermon series many years ago called American Heresy. And I did this sermon series, and what I did was I tried to preach a sermon um, on heresies that you will see when you are out soul winning. And I tried to kind of describe, you know, what the Pentecostals believe, what the Catholics believe, what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe, what the Mormons believe. We just did one. I just did one on Scientology. You're probably not going to run into them at the door. It's some wacky stuff. But you can go ahead and check out. We did a little mini documentary on that. But the point is, I kind of got out of that series a few years ago, and I'm just going to pop into it, you know, here and there, because it kind of got boring, actually. And you say, how could it be boring, Pastor? I mean, it was edifying for people to figure out, you know, what the hang-ups of a Pentecostal will be. You know, what, you know it's, it's nice to know where somebody's coming from when you're giving the gospel to them. So you know you know, you got to hit eternal security pretty well um, with this person, with their background. You know, obviously we're going to hit it, um, you know, always. But, you know, it, it, it just hang-ups that people might have coming from these backgrounds, these cultures, these heresies, right? But the thing is, they were all the same themes, at the end of the day, there's only two religions in the world. There's the gospel, and then it always came back to, I mean, there was, it, Scientology was really fun. I mean, it was like Xenu the alien dictator. I mean, that's, that's fun <laughs> stuff to preach. You know, Xenu the alien dictator and all these, you know, demons and thetans attached to your body and all this scam that these people are running. But at the end of the day, what is it? It's works. It's works-based theology every single time. And that's because it all comes from the same person. It all comes from the same source. So I want to give you three common themes tonight on really modern music that we see and just general secular music and especially focusing on where I came from with the countryside of things 
and what you see in the cities, hip hop, rap, all these things. You say, how could they possibly be the same? The messaging is exactly the same. And that's what I want to show you tonight. And look, I, I might even admit to you tonight that I think country music might be more damaging. Why? Because it seems more harmless? Because it seems more wholesome? But it's all teaching the same thing. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. Let's just look at a few things. Let's just look at a few things this evening and compare country music to, you know, hip-hop music. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 7 and look down at verse number 2. Now, the first, the first theme is fornication slash the abuse of women. And you say, you know, if you've ever wondered in the Bible, when you've read the Bible, and you've ever wondered why, like, it just seems like, like fornication in the Bible is treated so much more seriously against women. I mean, I'm sure you've thought that when you've read the Bible about what God says about fornication and marriage and, you know, reasons for divorce and the Old Testament law and all these things. The reason that it is that way is because fornication, and I'll prove it to you, the same thing is happening today. Fornication damages women more. People are so upset at us for preaching, like, the Bible. You know, the Bible family, the man's in charge of his household, and, and the wife should be, you know, submissive to her husband. It's like, oh, we're the only ones that actually have respect for women. All of this fornication culture is terrible for women. I mean, in hip-hop, you literally have, this is something that I noticed in California that has surprised me in just the last few years, coming from the eyes of somebody that's not really used to this. But you have literally women being called derogatory terms. You have women being, you know, just like, just not only just derogatory terms, but just speaking of women in the worst possible ways. And then you will see a woman driving in a car with her windows down, listening to this by herself, music degrading herself. And I'm like, what is going on here? What is happening? I mean, basically just object objectifying women. You say that's way worse than anything in country music. Wrong. Country music has an extreme promotion of fornication. And it may not be as blatant as just name calling women, but it has been promoting the fornication culture in this country for ever since the beginning of it. I can't think of any era of country music artist, even beyond my own, that did not promote fornication. It's all the same thing. It's all the same messaging. My, my question is, when are women in this country going to figure out that feminism is bad for them? That feminism, I have a conspiracy theory that feminism was invented by a man. <laughs> it, it's, it's horrible for women. It teaches them to disrespect and devalue their own bodies. Exactly what the Bible says. It basically gave men commitment-free access to women. And both of these cultures of music are pushing this agenda. You're saying, well, I listen to country music, seems wholesome. It is push I'm not going to read you any lyrics tonight. Because I don't want to put that stuff in your head. But look, it isn't good for men either. But it's especially not good for women. Now, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove it to you with some stats. I did a little bit of research. Did you know, did you know that today, Today, in, in 2024 America, men from the age, unmarried men from the age of 30 to 50, right in that, you know, they're gonna, they should be getting married range, they are three times more likely than women to not even have any interest in marriage. What's happening here? What's going on? Is somebody going to figure this stuff out? Where are, the, where are the scientists today? You don't need to have a Bible to figure out something's going on. Why the difference between men and women? Just think of that. One, I mean, it's literally one-third at this point. And by the way, it's never been higher in the United States. One-third of men from 30 to 50 have no interest in being married. None. 
They're like, we're good. You see, because outside of biblical conviction, why would a man want to get married today? What reason would there be? There's nothing, see, outside of biblical conviction, there's nothing but risk there. I was talking, <laughs> I was talking to a landscaper just two days ago. And, you know, either we were watching this, we were watching this loader do some work, and, and this landscaper turned to me and he said, he said, man, I saw my neighbor take one of those loaders and just like bulldoze half of his house, literally, like last week. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, he's getting divorced. And he's like, I'm not letting her have any of it. He's like, I'm going to give her her half in the street. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh. this is what people, this is what non-Christians see when they see, you know, the risk of marriage. They're like, why would I, why would I do that? I, I don't need, I, I don't want to be lonely, but I don't need to be lonely. You see? Because we have this fornication culture that is pushed from the West Coast to the East Coast and everything in, in the middle as well. That's what people think, you know, if I could just get out of California. They're going to get out of California and they're going to find out it's everywhere. You're like, oh, you shouldn't have left because it's nicer here. <laughs> but the point is this, overall marriage, overall marriage is at an all-time low in U.S. history. Why is that? Why is no one asking these questions? I mean, we know why. But why is nobody else wanting to figure this out? So you got, you got a third of men, 30 to 50, no interest. They're like, we're good. We don't want to be married. But guess what? Women in general still want to be married. Because God wrote it in their hearts. They have a maternal instinct. They want to raise children. They want that. 92% of women still want to be married in that same age group. Overall, marriage is an all-time low. Why? Because if you give something away for free, who would buy it? I'm not trying to be crude, but that, that's, that's it. If you give something away for free, who would buy it? You know what that means? Women have devalued themselves. This fornication culture pushed by everything from hip-hop all the way to the wholesome country music has devalued the women of this country. And they've done it to themselves. We've successfully objectified women and convinced them to have no respect for themselves. Go feminine. What are they thinking? You know what the, one of the main influences of this is? Music. Of all types. Turn to Isaiah chapter 28. What's the second one? What's the second one? Turn to Isaiah chapter number 28, if you would. Isaiah chapter 28. Look down at verse number 7. The second one that they both have in common is the glorification of drug and alcohol abuse. That it's cool. That it's fun. That it's harmless. You know, with the hip-hop, you got, oh, the, the weed is harmless, and all, you know, smoking marijuana is cool. And all this stuff, now they find out that it completely, permanently destroys your brain. Oops. Look down at Isaiah chapter 28. You say, well, country music doesn't really promote weed and drugs. That's true. Not yet, anyway. That's true. But look at verse number 7 of Isaiah chapter 28. Verse number 7, the Bible says, But they have also erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They're swallowed up of wine. They're out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. This is the conservative in our country today. Right here. They err in judgment. Why? Because they're drunk. That's why. But both of these cultures of music... They just like, oh, just fun, drugs, alcohol, you know, you're just going to be around a bunch of pretty people. It's nothing is ever going to happen. This, the worst thing about country music is that it tied this culture of masculinity with this culture of drunkenness. Sick. To the point where a man that has grown up in that culture can't even imagine himself being masculine if he's not a drunk. 
Look, if you, if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's real. That's a real thing. They tie, you know, drinking and being this drinking person to masculinity. Look, I, I grew up with some masculine individuals. I grew up around some tough characters. But this culture is destroying the character of that group of people. This is, this is the conservatives in this country today. This is the problem. The, the conservatives in this country, they're, they're like, they're looking around and they're like, what happened? How did we get here? How did this happen? It's because Satan got them all drunk. And he stole the church from them. He got them all drunk and he stole the school. While they were drunk, he stole the entire country. Because they, they, their vision is Isaiah 28. Their vision is gone. They think, oh, we're, we're going we're gonna to get it in this election. You're, like, you're still drunk, though. That's the problem. All these George Straits and these Alan Jacksons and Randy Travises, drunkenness, drunkenness, drunkenness. But they have a gospel album. <laughs> Still drunk. The country was lost from the pulpit. And the country was lost because the men went out and they got drunk. That was the view from where I was standing. It's the same. Both cultures. It's exactly the same. Turn to Proverbs chapter 14. Turn to Proverbs chapter 14. Say, what else could there be? Look at Proverbs chapter 14. Look at verse number 9. The third point where both of these cultures are pushing the same garbage that I want to make tonight is this idea of pushing this party life. I want you parents to listen up tonight. Pushing this idea that sin's no big deal. Pushing this idea that you can't have fun without going out and getting in a bunch of sin and trouble. Look at Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 9. The Bible says, fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. See, this idea that sin is no big deal, it, it's, it's worse. Look, this, these music cultures of hip-hop and country music, it is worse than making a mock of it. It is glorifying it. It is glorifying it and presenting it as something that it is not. It is presenting it as something that can give you something that it cannot. When it will actually give you the opposite. I mean, country and hip hop, it's all the same party lifestyle. It's all, I bet you if you went to a, if you shut off the sound and you looked from a drone view of a hip hop concert, it would look exactly the same as one as a, at a country concert. Exactly the same party lifestyle. Look, this is terrible to raise especially young people this way. Raising kids, you need to think about this when you're thinking, oh, I, I need to do something fun for my kids every five seconds. Raising kids to where, see, what this party lifestyle does, yes, it gets them into a bunch of sin that destroys their life, but it also trains them to be this person that needs to live off these extreme highs, these extreme dopamine hits, even, even outside of the alcohol and the drugs, which is all part of it. I mean, just party after party after party, and that becomes your life. It's just, look, you know what? If you raise children like that or they grow up in a culture like that, they will find no joy in hard work. They will find no joy in building something. They will find the Christian life to be what? To be boring. You know what I used to say? I, I, I don't have this in my sermon, and maybe I shouldn't confess this, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know what I used to say? I was Lutheran. I lived in Texas. And we had many Baptist friends. And I used to always say about the Baptists, you know, they're just no fun. But see, I, I wasn't, I didn't understand because I was drawn into all this. 
you cannot raise your children this way. They will find no joy in the things that will actually give them joy. Because guess what? Drunkenness will not bring them joy. It will bring them the reward of, of sin for a moment. The reward of iniquity for a moment. I'm sure Judas felt good for a few minutes when he held that silver in his hands. But what happened to him in the end? All these things that are promising joy to these people being raised in this lifestyle are just going to end up in destruction for them. And I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you through music. Turn to 2 Kings chapter number 3. Look, the, the, the folks, folks, I was saved later in life. You think about your kids this evening. I was saved later in life, but let me tell you something. One of the hardest things for me to put aside and cut away from was music. Your mind is an infinite recording device. They have tried to measure it. They can't. They think that, I mean, we can measure everything. We can measure how far a 16-inch gun on a battleship, we'll probably drop that shell within 10 yards or something. But we can't measure how much your brain can record because it just keeps recording and recording and recording. And one of the best ways that you can record things and remember things is through music. You need to be careful with music. Turn to 2 Kings. I'm going to turn there myself. Look at 2 Kings chapter number 3 and look at verse number 15. I used to say... I used to say, when, before I gave up certain music, you know, I used to say, I even told my wife this, I was like, I just like the tune, I don't listen to the words. I just like the tune. I don't listen to the words. But look down at verse number 15 of 2 Kings chapter 3, where the Bible says, actually go to verse 14. It says, And Elisha said, As the Lord of the hosts liveth, before, before whom I stand, surely... It were not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. I would not look toward thee, nor see thee. But look at this in verse 15. But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass, when the minstrel played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. This is very similar to what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where the tune that was played here literally brought, his, brought the Lord's spirit to him. The opposite can be true. If it works one way with a certain song and tune, there is a non-edifying way that it can work as well. Look, music is powerful, and you all know that it is. It literally can change your mood. It can change your mood. I, I was a wrestler, and before I, I wrestled, I listened to some music that changed my mood on purpose, because I wanted to change my mood. It can bring back memories. You can hear a song that you heard, and it can remind you of something vivid 25 years ago. Look, what, what the Bible is saying here in, in 2, Corinthians, 2 Kings chapter 3, and this is why Satan, turn to Ezekiel chapter 28, this is why Satan uses music, is because music touches your spirit. Music moves your emotions, and it can move you towards the Lord or it can move you away from the Lord. Satan was a musical being for sure. Look at verse number 13 of Ezekiel chapter 28. So you wonder, why are all these themes the same? Why does it, ma why does it not matter if I go to rap music or rock and roll music or country music or whatever music. I know I kind of use country and hip-hop here. Why does it not matter? Why are the themes of fornication and making light of sin and alcohol and drugs and abuse of women and all these different things, why are they all the same? Because they all it's the same thing with the heresies because they all come from the same place. Look down at verse number 13. Talking about Satan here, the Bible says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, and the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. And the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, and hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Satan's a musical being. I don't know if he was the only musical being 
People say he was the chief musician in heaven. Well, you know, he was a musical being. That's what we know. And music is one of his most powerful tools that he uses on this earth. And look, musicians, musicians, and I, I can't even read you all the different things that I'm going to read you tonight because there, there's just too many of them. Musicians throughout history have constantly through the years alluded Many times, like, I think this is kept secret with most people, but many times people have just given interviews and just told, like, that they've literally made a deal with Satan. It's real. It's as real as Satan himself. Let me, I mean, let me just give you a few examples, like, spanning a couple of hundred years. There was a man named Giuseppe Tartini. He was, you know, he was born in 1692. He was a violinist. He is considered to be this virtuoso. Nobody could understand how he could play the violin, how he played. He composed the Devil's Trill Sonata, a piece so complicated, many modern players struggle to play it. This is a quote from him. Asked about his, his abilities and his reason that he wrote this sonata and how he was able to play it, this is a quote from this man, born in 1692. He said, one year in the year 1713, I dreamed I had made a pact with the devil for my soul. Everything went as I wished. My new servant anticipated my every desire. Among other things, I gave him my violin to see if he could play. How great was my astonishment on hearing a sonata so wonderful and so beautiful. It played with such great art and played with such great art and intelligence as I had never even conceived in my boldest flights of fantasy. I, I felt enraptured, transported, and enchanted. My breath failed me, and I awoke, and I immediately grasped my violin in order to retain, in part at least, my impression of the dream. The music that I composed is indeed the best I have ever wrote, and I still call it the Devil's Trill. 1890 a man named Ferdinand Morton claims he invented jazz. You say, well, hip-hop and country music? Well, let's go back to jazz. He, freaked, he invented jazz is how he frequently introduced himself. In a 1915 piece, Jelly Roll Blues, Blues was the first published jazz composition, so he probably did invent jazz. However, Morton's talent stemmed from a place much darker than the vibrant, upbeat music he composed. It is said that Jelly's godmother Yule Lee Echo, a French-speaking Creole who practiced voodoo, sacrificed Jelly's soul to Satan as part of a black magic ritual in exchange for inhuman musical talent and fame. What followed was a prolific musical career as Morton took his place as the most supreme figure in America's thriving jazz scene. In 1939, the record company Victor offered Jelly a rec recording contract as the leading composer and conductor of early jazz. Morton was so successful he could afford to wear diamonds in his teeth and his socks, leading to his trademark rhinestone-studded smile. But eventually, Morton got his side of the deal. And so the time came when he had to keep up his side of the pact. Two years after signing with Victor, his old voodoo godmother, Yuli Echo, was dead. Jelly's girlfriend, Anita Gonzalez, said this, Jelly's always knew she sold him to Satan and that when she died, he'd die too. She would take him down with her. And within two months, Morton passed away. He was 46 years old. Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> Jimmy Voodoo Child Hendrix. Acknowledged by many people. I mean, you talk to somebody who is a guitar player or whatever, and they will say he is the best guitar player that has ever walked the face of the planet. But he had a keen, keen interest in spiritism. A conga player who played with Hendrix was from a village in Ghana, West Africa, where his father was a voodoo priest. It's been said that one of the first things his friend did was ask Jimmy where he got his voodoo rhythm from, as many of Hendrix's signature rhythms were the very same ones that his voodoo father played in voodoo ceremonies. Alan Douglas, Hendrix's road manager and producer, expressed his concern for the musician's well-being. One of the biggest things, this is a quote, one of the biggest things about Jimmy was what he believed in. He believed that he was possessed by some spirit, and I believe it myself, the road manager said. 
He was very humble about discussing with people because he didn't want people to feel he was being pretentious and so on, but he really believed it, and he was wrestling with it constantly. His long-term girlfriend, Jimi Hendrix's long-term girlfriend, said this. He said he used to always talk about some devil, something was in him, and he didn't have any control over it, and he didn't know what made him act the way he acted and what made him say the things he said and play the songs and different things that just came out of him. It seems to me he was so tormented and so tore apart that he really, really, what, he would talk to us about going down to Georgia and getting rid of this evil thing, having some root lady drive out his demon out of him. September 18, 1970, at the age of 27, Hendrix died of asphyxia. I could just keep reading on and on and on. In 2004, Bob Dylan did an actual interview with 60 Minutes. Bob Dylan. He does super successful artist. He does this interview with 60 Minutes, and the 60 Minutes interviewer literally says to him, I mean, is asking him, how do you do it? And he's like, he literally says, like, I don't even know, like, how I wrote this stuff. He's like, I, I, I don't even know. But then he says this. He says it's a destiny thing. Quote, I made a devil's bargain, and I'm holding up my end. And if you go and you look for that on YouTube, that 60 Minutes thing, they bleep out the word devil. So it just, it's like, I made a bargain. But then he goes and he says this. I mean, the, the interviewer said this. What was your bargain? And, and Dylan said, to get where I am now. And the interviewer said, who did you bargain with? You know what he says? He says, the chief commander in this earth and the world we can't see. What does 2 Corinthians chapter 4 say? That Satan is the god of this world. He made a devil's bargain with the devil. There are stories like this could go on and on and on. John Lennon, you know, the, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Snoop Dogg. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. Look, it is, even if there was no official deal, the sign is the message that they are projecting. The sign is the message that they are projecting and the talent that they have. Look, people are saying, I mean, think about it. If, if I gave you a list, and the thing, the thing about people that make deals with Satan and follow Satan, the point is this, folks. It's fame through a message. That's the deal. The deal is give me talent, give me fame, give me money, give me success in this world, and Satan's like, I will give you that, but you will speak my words. You will, you will do a song called Highway to Hell, yeah. making light of eternal destruction to young people in the nation. Where's dad? Oh, he's drunk. Listening to George Strait. It's all the same bargain. And it, look, it's it, just like the heresies, it's got Satan's fingerprints all over it. It's everywhere. Satan gives the talents, but he gets the messaging. That's the deal. And it's all the same message. But turn to John chapter 10. Here's the idiocy of these people that follow Satan. You say people have to choose Satan or God, Satan or Jesus Christ. Who would choose Satan? He kills them all. He destroys everything. Look at John chapter 10 and verse number 10. We just studied through this um, in our, our study of the book of John. But look at what the Bible says. Jesus is saying, no, I'm the shepherd. you got to come through the door. As a matter of fact, I am the door. And there's no other way except me. Look at John chapter 10 and verse number 10. But somebody else wants to come in another way or convince you that there is another way. It says, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and destroy. That's all Satan does. He steals and kills and destroys, especially the people that follow him. Jimi Hendrix died choking on his own vomit when he was 27 years old. You know how many of these stars and musical artists died choking on their own vomit? The list is long. But they made the deal. But guess what? Satan destroyed him anyway. Because what does he do? He destroys. That's all he does. If you look at those three words, I mean, just, I mean, this is another sermon in itself, but I mean, the Christian life is the opposite of those things. Think about it. Steal, kill, destroy. What do we do? We give the gift of salvation. 
We give things away. You go out and charge people soul winning? No, we go out and we give away eternal life. We don't kill. We give, you know, through God's word, we give people everlasting life through Jesus Christ. We give them that message freely. We build. We don't destroy. We want to get people in church. We want to build people in their Christian life. It's exactly the opposite, but that is all Satan does is destroy. It's not like he's got these minions on this earth and he treats them really well. No, he kills them. He killed them when he was 27. But guess what? You say, why would he kill them if he was working for them? Guess what? That music lives forever. He got what he wanted. He got the material and that music is it's everlasting on this earth. If you've he heard these music, these songs, you'll remember them till you're dead. You'll remember them. I mean, thank God that, you know, my children and your children aren't going to have to have that stuff recorded in their head. I mean, you ever thought, like, walk through a store or something, and you ever thought, like, they're still playing the song? Don't they have new songs? <laughs> We're walking through, like, a home goods store, you know, a couple months ago, and they played a song, they played the song called Walk Like an Egyptian. <laughs> Walk like an Egyptian. <laughs> and like my kids are like, they're listening to the, they're listening to the song. And they don't even know words, they don't even write words, and they're just like blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, kids, like people used to love this song. And they would walk around like this. <laughs> and my kids are like, Dad, stop it. Quit lying. Look, the point of the whole sermon tonight is influence, is influence. And to be careful, look, here's the application for you. You need to be careful who and what influences you. Turn to Proverbs chapter 13. The devil, these people made, I mean, people are like the Super Bowl. They're like, well, there was a, a devil sign or something that somebody made uh, during the Super Bowl. Probably. I mean, what, what's the message? The message is Satan's message. And we're shocked that somebody does a devil ritual on a stage or something. It's like, no. Okay, so they didn't come out and give a 60 Minutes interview, but they're working for Satan. It's the same thing. Why? Because the message is his message. The deal is all the same. And no matter when that artist dies or what the end of that artist is, that message lives on. And people that heard that tune attached to those words that is literally tattooed in their mind forever. So the application tonight is just the influence of the things in your life, the influence, the things that are after you and after your kids in your life. It's all about influence. That's the devil's game right there with music. So you need to ask yourself who and what influences you. I hope. I hope your pastor influences you. I mean, that's an easy one. But I mean, you know, I mean, the problem with this country, or one of the main problems with this country, is you got parents out there today, and they're upset. They're upset that what? They don't have influence. They're upset that somebody else is doing the influence. You know, we got an entire generation of confused kids coming our way. I mean, just confused. I mean, they say Gen Z. Gen Z, one in five, 20%. They're confused about if they're a boy or a girl or what, the, what they are. And I'm like, this is like thousands of percent increase in, in this thing. And I'm like, all right, like some scientist is gonna, is gonna pick this one up and even like, this is one of those things like you don't have to read the Bible to know something's going on here. And sure enough, somebody wrote a book a couple years ago that, like, hey, we think it's a social contagion. Like, you think? We just studied Psalm chapter 82 last night. And Psalm chapter 82 is basically God yelling at the leaders. God is yelling at the leaders because he's saying, you know what? You're allowing the wicked to harm the poor and the needy and the fatherless. That's exactly what's going on with this generation. You got an entire, look, you got an entire, parents don't like it, but they don't have the influence. You got the wicked doing, you got the wicked 
influencing and confusing a child, and then you got a confused child confusing children. It's exactly what's happening. It's all about the influence. Parents, they don't have it anymore. That's the problem. Proverbs 13, are you there? Look at verse number 20. There was, a, there was some motivational speaker or something that I heard years ago. He said, he said you are the sum of your friends. I mean, there, there's some truth there, right? There's some truth there. Like, I don't know if he was coming at it from the perspective of, like, success in life or something like that, or maybe even income or something. They've done studies where it's like, if you hang out with a bunch of, you know, people that don't make any money, you don't make any money or something like that, right? But guess what? If there's any truth to anything, it's already in the Bible. Look down to verse number 20 of Proverbs 13. You are the sum of your friends. And he writes a book, and everyone's like, brilliant! But look at Proverbs 13 and verse number 20. It says, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Look, let me rephrase that, you know, according to the sermon tonight. If you're influenced by wise people, you will be wise. In what way? Every way. If you're influenced by fools, you will be a fool. In what way? In every way. To the point where you will what? You'll, you'll be completely destroyed. Turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Look at Romans chapter 7. See, what we want for our kids bringing it back to the musical sermon here. What we want for our kids, and let me tell you something, it's possible. I loved that moment in Home Goods where my kids were like, this is really stupid. And I'm like, thank you. I'm like, I used to like that. <laughs> but we don't want them to have to go down that road. And it's possible to raise your children where they will hear this stuff and they'll be like, that is wicked as hell where they will hear the words, and they will never say, oh, but, you know, the lyrics, I just, eh. Well, they will, they will hear, they will sit in a restaurant, and they will hear lyrics. They'll be like, I'm not going to come back to this restaurant anymore. Because I don't know what this song is, but what they're saying is wicked as hell. What they're saying is, a, it, it's literally, they'll be offended, because they'll be like, this, this, this wording is against my Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we need to put in the hearts of our children. Where they, you know what? They'll stand up for God. They'll stand up for Jesus Christ. And they hear wicked garbage. I don't care how pretty it sounds or what tune they put it with. They'll say, no, I know what the truth is. Look down at Romans 7. Look at verse number 13. Was that which is good made death unto me? He's talking to the law. He's talking about the law. He's talking about the Bible. He's talking about the word of God. God forbid, but sin what is the point of teaching our children the Bible? What is our point? What is the point of having your children here in church listening to your pastor yell at you three times a week? What's the point of that? It is so they will learn the word God. What is the point of homeschooling and pulling them out of that influence and teaching them the word of God in your own home and giving them that worldview? Teaching our daughters, you know what? You have value in this life. God loves you, he values you, and here's what he wants you to do, little girl. Here's who he wants you to be. Teaching our boys to be strong men without being drunks. That actually drunkenness is weakness. It's, the, uh, it's, not, it's not like it's a little bit, it's completely opposite of the truth. The message of Satan. He destroys God builds. It is possible today, even with everything that you see, for your kids to hear this stuff. Keep reading. But sin, that it might appear exceedingly, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment, by the law, by the word of God, might appear exceedingly sinful. It will pop out at them. They won't care what the tune is. They'll hear those words. And you know what? They'll even hear the tune and know that the tune's bad. They'll, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's, they'll hear the song. They don't even need to hear words and be like, this isn't good. Why? Because the sounds matter and the words matter. 
but it'll but as they sharpen themselves on the word of God, these kids won't fall for any of it. It'll work. It's 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 guaranteed. Did it say that it might uh, that that by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful? Uh, maybe. No, it, it's, it will happen. And you can see it happening in the generation that we are raising now. It's a beautiful thing. When they hear stupid things, it will pop out at them. They will reject it outright. They'll be speaking to themselves in songs and hymns and spiritual songs that bring them closer to the Lord and strengthen them. Everything else will be exceedingly sinful. Unfortunately, today... What you're seeing around us is Satan is just winning this game of influence. He's winning. Music, just like false religion, nice thing about Satan, though, he's super unoriginal. And once you know the Bible, it's super easy to pick him out. Because it doesn't matter what the music is. It doesn't matter what the tune is. What, what's the messaging? What's the messaging? The messaging is all the same. So you see how I brought our cultures together tonight? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.